Hello, everyone, and <laughs> welcome to tomorrow, episode 12.09. Very glad to have you here. My name is Jared, and I've also got Sarah here as well. And we're going to be co-hosting this show because we have an awesome guest today, live by request, uh, because <laughs> you all asked him to come back. We have Mr. Rod Pyle on our What's show up? today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last year, you came on the show, and it was an absolute riot to have you on here. We talked about you know space stories and, and talked about some things that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later uh, again, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll <laughs> we're just gonna have such a good anything you like that's past the statute of limitations. As yes. You said earlier, you bet. <laughs> we were just talking about Got it. that. So, <laughs> so, Rod, just to kind of get this started, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for the folks who may not have caught the episode last year. So I was born before the beginning of time, back at the <laughs> early start of the space age, and um, didn't realize until just a few years ago how fortunate I was to have grown up in the 1960s, mm -hmm. well, in the 70s, kind of, <laughs> not that old. But I, I, I mean, I was able to watch the, the last part of the Gemini program yep. live as it was happening. I was able to watch all of, all of Apollo live as it was happening. So as my friends were trading football cards and baseball cards and the kind of things we did then, <laughs> um, I was there staying home from school, playing hooky, watching guys walking on the moon, yeah. which was great until Apollo 14, when the networks realized nobody was gonna die out there mm -hmm. in that particular flight, and right in the middle of the guys going up side of Cone Crater, they cut off, they cut back to <sighs> Days of Our Lives, and I Love Lucy reruns, I kid you not. Mm, no, guys you... on the moon. We got used to it a little fast. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my first lesson in space journalism, was I thought, you know, I kind of thought I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> Had a chance of that, right? And then I thought, ah, I'm gonna want to be a planetary scientist, and I thought, no, I want to be a space journalist because mm -hmm. somebody's got to tell people how cool this is because yeah. they don't get it. And a lot of people still don't get it, no. which mm -hmm. is why you guys are so important. And, and you. I, hope. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. You, you're, yeah, but, yeah. you're still working as well as a yeah. space journalist. So Oh, endlessly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did four books last year. Actually, five if you count the one I do for JPL. So, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> a, a very highly informative year for the public. So, anyway, that's what I do now. I had a bunch of careers in TV commercials and so forth and did visual effects on Star Trek for a while, which was great fun, because it was the very end of the period we got to work with the miniatures. Mm -hmm. nice. So instead of yeah. doing CGI, you got to go out and position the thing and look at it. Like actually yep. physically yeah. moved things. Yeah, it, and, so. and you could pretend. You could go up to it and go, look, it's a real spaceship. And um, Practical is... had those moments. Uh, see? Uh, see? It's see? underrated. Mm -hmm. Well, and Interstellar and a number of other movies, uh, The Passenger, those are all practical effects. So, yeah. So that was very cool. And now uh, I do space books and I edit a magazine for the National Space Society called Ad Astra. Yeah. Nice. Which, nice. if you're not getting copies, you should be because it's really cool now. Do you have to be a and member you of... say so yourself. Do you, do you have to be a member <laughs> of the National Space Society to get it? Why no? Yeah. Oh, all you have do to you do have is some sit here? here and talk to me and I will... <laughs> To the stars. Yeah. Wow, look at this. And it's like heavy that paper, is, oh, too. Man. So it feels oh, really you can actually file so. your navels on the cover. Yes. Like it's that kind of heavy. Uh -huh. so you're not stock. wrong. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. So it's, it's a quarterly, mm -hmm. and they've been doing okay. it for, I don't know, 38 years now or something under various names. But it has just been a blast. Oh, oh, I look just flipped this. open to this guy. Hey, oh, look. Oh, suddenly. <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Well, I had to say, hey, I'm your new editor now. Yeah, so um, there you go. A message from the new guy. But it is so. Well, oh, what else would you call it, it right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, what are you going to say? New guy. Yeah, quite nice. But so. it, it's, it's, you know, it's the mouthpiece of the organization. Internally, we're doing an Apollo special edition for mid year. Oh, awesome. It's going to be about 90 pages. And that one's going to be available to the public. So we're hoping that we can kind of open the door and. Get more members in. Yeah. And if you guys aren't members, you should be because if you were, you would also get. <laughs> is he going to come to stop me? <laughs> the roadmap to space. This is what you're here for. Nice. <laughs> Which is the next 40 years or so that in like, how we're going to go out and. This, this looks like the in flight uh, the solar system. magazine on airplanes. It yeah, kind of does. <laughs> well, it was interesting because, you know, if you're talking about space settlement, what comes to most people's minds is. Oh, the tin cans in space, right? Or mm -hmm. lava tubes, if you're a little more with it. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, what's a soft way to say it? What does that really mean? If you if you buy into the idea of space settlement, which we do, mm -hmm. um, it means normal people living up there in shirt sleeves, mm -hmm. doing what we're doing right now yeah. in an environment like this. And I thought, let's use this. Jim Vaughn is this illustrator we used for the covers of the magazine. I mm -hmm. said, let's use this picture of this little girl. Yeah, that's I just fantastic. love that because it's like, 
Hey, look at that. She's got a little yeah. teddy bear hanging down. Yeah, there. she does. She's yeah. just kind of she's just checking she's just checking out the view. Yeah. yeah. So like like anybody would at that right. So yeah, very very cool. So <laughs> so I burned up that time pretty well, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. Well, I was gonna say if you could actually tell yeah. us a little bit about the yeah. National Space Society, you know okay. what what you do, and if people do want to become members of it, you know how do they do that? Just send checks. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's been around <laughs> since the late seventies. So it was a merger of the National Space Institute, which Von Braun started mm -hmm. while he was still at NASA, um, to sort of get the word out to the public in a way more direct than NASA public relations could, because they mm -hmm. were kind of constrained at the time. Yeah. And of the L5 Society, which was um, Gerard O'Neill's group. Mm -hmm. So uh, they merged in, I think, 84, and they've been doing what they do ever since, which is really just trying to spread the word of space settlement and the idea that not just that, but that a robust space program is really good for the country and really good mm -hmm. for the world. Yeah. And that there's a lot of benefits to come. It's not just about adventure and exploration, which are good things mm -hmm. if you get into the philosophical side of the discussion, but they only go so far. Yeah. You know, We are, as I mentioned in my new book, Space 2.0, mm -hmm. entering a new space age. Mm -hmm. And this one's going to be driven by economics. It's not going to be a ge geopolitics this time. It's going to be about people making money and yeah. finding ways to go out there and benefit all we hope everybody on earth yeah. so we talk about a lot about we have an annual conference where we talk a lot about things like space solar power you know you've got these big power stations up in orbit soon we hope mm. beaming power down to the planet's <laughs> surface and we don't have to burn oil and kill ourselves anymore so it's a pretty good deal mm -hmm. so people can join by going to space.nss.org yeah i remember that right <laughs> first year is 20 bucks it's a great deal and wow. you get the magazine. Yeah. And a lot of people are asking in our chat room about how to how the plans are to normalize sending people to space. You know, sending people like us who aren't professional astronauts to space. Like what is that what does that look like? It still looks like a big challenge. I mean, if you've been tracking, which I'm sure you have, Virgin Galactic, you can see how hard it is. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. He was predicting two thousand eight, yeah, we'll be flying in hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um you know, with the best of intentions, it's turned out to be really hard. There's still, you know, that hardest part is from right here to 62 miles up there. Mm -hmm. After that, it's gravy. You know, as long as you got life support and some kind of propulsion system, you're good to go. But that initial vertical hop is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to look increasingly like, um, like what SpaceX and Blue Origin are doing. Mm -hmm. I think rocket planes do still have a future, but that straight old vertical lift using chemicals as they have been, it's just a question of making it repeatable and recyclable and affordable, which is why I think for me, and a lot of people would disagree with this, I think, but for me, watching the launch of the Falcon Heavy was kind of finally that mm -hmm. hammer drop that said, bang, the new space age is here. You know, it's happening again, you're watching it, and it's this billionaire who just said, I like rockets, I'm gonna build some, and I'm gonna make them reusable and affordable, and start sending a lot of people out there. And he and Bezos have really turned this whole thing around. Now ULA and Northrop Grumman and the other companies mm -hmm. are following that lead and they're reinventing themselves very quickly to be able to participate in this, which is great. But I think it really took these guys, these eccentric guys, if you can call them eccentric, coming along and they're saying- They're rich, so they're eccentric, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be that eccentric <laughs> for a percentage of it. And, and, and look at Bezos, you know, here's yeah. a guy who's cashiering a billion dollars of his own stock every year to finance this dream. Yeah. Now he can do that for, I don't know what, another 150 years, so mm -hmm. and, you know that's pretty good net worth. But I mean, the commitment that takes yeah. is just breathtaking. So I think that's what's gonna do it. And ultimately finding reasons to be out there. And that's been for so long part of the argument. Yeah. You know, NASA has, has been trying to sell the American public on the space program since 1961 when Kennedy first announced the Apollo flights. And there's only so much you can say when you're doing it in that way for those reasons. But when you're able to say, you know, we're gonna go out there and do commerce and you're mm -hmm. gonna have a better life, benefits on Earth, benefits yeah. for people out there, now you've got a real conversation going. Well, mm -hmm. NASA with the uh, asteroid redirect mission or ARM, they had an attempt at kind of getting into that commercial f for profit ish aspect, um, but then that got defunded. Um, do you think that's going to be resurrected as we get farther along with this uh, commercial? 
I, you know, I kind of doubt NASA will go back to that. There really was never a compelling reason to send people there except mm -hmm. for the engineering exercise, I okay. think. You know, it gave SLS something to do. Right. It was a big technological challenge. But if you want to go grab samples from an asteroid, send a robot. They're smart. You know, they're not meat mm -hmm. bags like us. They do really well out there. Yeah, they, they don't, don't complain. The yeah. They don't they need don't air. They don't need water. Yes. They, they don't, don't need food. Yeah. They don't, they don't need rupture protection. like we do. You know, <laughs> yes. they, don't, they don't get cancer. They just sit out there and get a little dumber as the radiation cooks their very old processor chips. <laughs> but, you know, it makes a lot of sense for machines to do that. And I think overall, when you talk about robotics versus people, which is kind of the classic <laughs> National Space Society, Planetary Society conversation, right. robots are better, no people are better. We don't have that conversation anymore but in the past. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a place for both. Robots have to go first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now, because robots are getting really smart and we have additive manufacturing, robots can not only go first and look around and explore, you know, dig little trenches and stuff, they can also prepare the infrastructure so exactly. that people go mm -hmm. in it makes sense. Yeah. So, hey, go... Robots, go forth, Gort, and go in the lava tube and build my condo, and then I'll go hang out there in comfort, and you can go up on the surface and get irradiated. I think that's perfect. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, with with the ability to do telepresence, and especially with VR be, kind of becoming a very popular thing once again, yeah. um, stuff like that actually could allow you to operate in places that otherwise you wouldn't really be able to operate in. Um, and you don't necessarily have to do it like, you know, in the lava tube underground and at the surface, you know, I know there's some, been some ideas to put people on Phobos and have them operate robots on the surface of Mars as well. So, yeah. um, so without having, well, you know, without having to dive into the gravity well of Mars in order to do that. But so. don't you want to dive into the gravity well? I do. Yeah. I know I do. I do. Yeah. So. You know, but, but it is interesting. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about, you know, this telepresence and short latency and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been hearing that discussion since, well, not hearing it, but researching it mm -hmm. since the late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. when they were talking about, uh, especially in the, in the late 60s, they were talking about doing, we talked about this last time I was here, doing flybys of Venus and Mars mm -hmm. with Apollo-derived hardware mm -hmm. yeah. because it's something you could do. Yeah. Well, when asked, well, why would we want to do, you know, you're traveling for the better part of a year or more for a 12 hour, eight hour flyby of this planet on the dark side, they said, because we can control the robots right there with sticks yeah. and push buttons, because robots were stupid and, and fallible then. Yeah. Now they're really smart and they're really robust, so is it imp that important to cross that last bit? I don't know. Mm. You know, At Mars it makes sense because you're talking about 20 minutes. They're right. talking about doing robotic, you know, essentially telepresence around the moon with the you know, LOPG or Gateway or whatever it is this week. <laughs> I think it's Gateway now. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it kind of makes sense, but because, I just so, want to do something there. You yeah. know, if that's the best reason to do it in their book, that's okay with me. But I, you know, it also begs the question of what, at a certain point, what is being there? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need to take our, our meat bags there to be there? Or do we have really sophisticated telepresence? And at a certain point, probably not in the too distant future, I bet you play game, computer games, right? Mm -hmm. At yeah. a certain point in the future, how are you going to know the difference between here and there and being in the game and being outside? And yeah, there's the latency issue of the, of the, of the signal and so forth, but at a certain point, I almost kind of wonder if sensing that you're there is going to be enough for most people, you know? Mm. And we just have machines doing it. I mean, the best way to go to space, I think, is to transfer my consciousness, I'm volunteering, into a little <laughs> robotic cockroach about this big. Mm -hmm. He's radiation proof. He doesn't care about, about being in a vacuum. He doesn't care about temperatures and all those things. He's just a little happy robotic cockroach. And, you know, maybe send some little girl robotic cockroaches. They'll look attractive enough after a while. Everything will work out. And we, you know, our mass is very small and we go off and explore Venus and just that's yeah. my space program. Yeah. Well, I'm with you on on the transfer of consciousness. If somebody could do that, you know, figure that out very quickly, uh, I would have no problem exploring space that way too. That yeah. seems like a, a, a very interesting way to, to actually go about doing that. So. And I wouldn't mind going into a young, young Arnold Schwarzenegger's body, but if but I think the cockroaches work better because they're yeah. low mass. I mean, just as long as the chassis looks good. Yeah. So and that's not in the roadmap to space, yeah. by the way. That's, no, there's that's no my personal thing. Oh, yeah. And it says isn't necessarily big on the robot thing. That's kind of my, you know. Yeah. Hey, I'm a futurist uh -huh. or something. Right? Uh, 
I personally, That's what happens when you work at Griffith. You get these kind of ideas because they, oh, no, yeah, they make I've, you brilliant. I've definitely yeah. thought of that as well. But um, for me, my question is getting that information back because you haven't built those neural pathways. You, those memories of your cockroach, they don't get back to you. So... Well, in the case I'm describing, I am the cockroach. You, you just become the cockroach. Just, that is that, your future. Yeah, they take my brain. <laughs> they take the little part of my brain that still works at my age, and they say, here, we'll just stick it in there. The then, rest of it isn't important. Then I want to go a lot bigger than a cockroach. I want to, I want to, I'm a fan of the thumbs. I want to be able to manipulate things. Cockroaches are like, let me, let me, thumbs. let me, let me push this yeah. dirt ball. Yeah, but <laughs> they got six legs. They have six legs that they you need all, that all for stuff. walking. They have these. No, you can, yeah. <laughs> there are six legs. Six six. We're getting a little weird here, aren't we? But there's got to well, be a way, you know, you can there, bend in the middle. Is there something wrong with I mean, weird? <laughs> think of having a thorax now. And you can bend up and you can use four of your arms up front so you don't need opposable thumbs, right? I could get a lot more get done awesome. with four arms than I could with just how I am right now. Think so. of being with Donald's. Burger, fries, shake. Diet Coke. I would, one Because I'm weird right. enough to mix the shake with the Diet Coke. <laughs> Look, I'm saving sugar. And um, yeah, with forearms, you could just kind of, it doesn't do much for dieting, but uh, exercise would be interesting. A lot of things would be interesting. With yeah. I guess. Well, if you're a robot, exercise doesn't matter. And isn't that a cool idea? <laughs> right? I can so consume like, power and, and, and oil, aspects. yeah, without ever gaining an ounce. Oh, I like this better and better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> But I think, you know, we've got a lot of interim steps between here and, and, and the roach bots. Just a right. few. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just a few. And, and one of them is, you know, so the, the solar system turned out to be so much nastier than we thought. When I was a kid, oh, yeah. they hadn't done their first flyby yet. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And I, rem I was old enough to remember that moment when Mars died. Because <sighs> mm, we had right. Ray Bradbury, we had Edgar Rice Burroughs, we had Princess. Deja Thoris on Mars and the Thoats and all this cool and then stuff. And Mariner 4 it went just past her day, and just right? Screwed everything up. I, Maybe I had this, some methane by. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was doing this book panel at JPL, I don't know, four years ago or something. I thought, how am I going to open? I thought, I know. So I got up there and said, hi, I just want to let you, let you people know that you ruined space for me. And here's uh. how um, <laughs> you killed Mars. And they're like, what's wrong with this guy? Yep. But I mean, we really had this great. So we had the idea that at least the terrestrial worlds in the solar system were kind of like other Earths. Mm -hmm. And it was a little colder, a little drier on Mars. And Venus was probably warm and swampy and might have dinosaurs. I mean, the scientists were thinking of this at, right. at that point when yeah. I was a kid. Right. But a lot of people still have this popular vision. And we didn't know for sure. Even the scientists thought, well, maybe there's lichen on Mars and you know, various plants and yeah, that's Possibly why. Liquid yeah. Water that's why those dark and, areas move around on Mars. That's why they shift right. in shape and things yeah. like, like that. What so. was the deal with the wave of darkening? I still haven't read a good explanation of what that really was. Well, maybe it was a dust storm. I don't see it now. Anyway, we yeah. got out there and discovered the solar system was pretty hostile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And space kind of hates people. Yes. And yeah. says, stay on Earth where you belong. Barstow is better than anywhere else in the solar system. So you know, stay in Barstow. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, it may not be as entertaining, but environmentally, it's better. Yeah. You can stand there yeah. and breathe, and you know there's water yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I've always it. said, you know, the Mojave is basically Mars, but about 200 degrees warmer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and about a thousand times kinder to your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that too. Your yeah. eyeballs won't invert and go right? dangling down. Yeah. Plus all that radiation so. blocking of Earth. Yes, yeah. there's also that too. Yeah. So very handy. So, yeah. And on Mars, you know, the thing that 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 still gets ignored. Just talking about how difficult it is to do these things and why we still haven't gone there, even mm -hmm. though in the 60s. Von Braun and guys like that kind of promised me by the 80s we'd be there, and yeah. I'm a little bent about that. But if you saw The Martian, which I'm sure you did, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing that kind of bugged me was, oh, I lost part of my uh, the structure of my habitat. I'll just staple up some, some plastic sheeting there. That'll be fine. In, uh, in you the know, book, it's a, a lot better. It's a pressure differential. Okay. <laughs> But then he goes in there, he's farming his potatoes, and I'm looking at him thinking, that soil is for a per, full of perchlorates. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your eyes would be fizzing, your lips would be, you know, you'd be turning into a, a Gila monster or something. So it just, I guess what I'm getting at is, we got a lot of stuff to figure out, and the more we study it, the more we realize how hard it is. Right. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's and keep going. I think you kind of hit on it. NASA has a PR problem of reality. NASA deals in the real. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Of the harshness of space, and we want the fantasy. We want Venus. We to want be. Mars One. We, because how hard can it be, <laughs> right? Look at it, Lisa. <laughs> I'll sell some reality show tickets. 
Is right? She, is she uh, a candidate? She 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 knows a candidate. <laughs> And now she's looking away. She's not she, looking at us. Yeah. <laughs> me, me and Lisa know the same candidate, so I think we're yeah. just going to sit here quietly. Well, and there was a great there was a great article by by a woman named Elmo Keep, who's I think in Australia. Oh, God. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> who went through the process? Now, you know, you, you she never. Continued the candidate we're talking about. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so I'm going to switch stories. So I was at the solar eclipse last year, <laughs> or was it 17 or 18? 17. Went, yeah. 17. yeah. yeah. It's, it's time, close enough to be Time last dilation year. due to age. <sighs> but I was at that solar eclipse. We were sitting in Prineville, Oregon, mm -hmm. which is, it was so sad because the, the whole Main Street was lined with tables with eclipse t-shirts and glasses and they were going to make millions uh, and it was eclipse apocalypse and all this kind of stuff. They're looking up and down the street and there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. Everybody had gone further north. Yeah. So it was great for me. Got a hotel. There was the park down there. But there was a guy that showed up who was going up to, they were doing some rock concert kind of uh, festival thing up in the woods, which I wanted to stay well away from. I just wanted to see the eclipse. Mm -hmm. I was just there to see the eclipse, not to, you know, bathe in mud and those kinds of things. And um, this guy was, was a Mars One devotee. So it's me, my son, and the NSS guy named Dave Dressler and this fellow. And he is, you know, because he knows I write books, he's got, got to convince me. Oh. This is a real thing. And he's going on and on. And my kid's just staring at me through the whole thing because he knows me. You know? <laughs> and he's like, he's just waiting for the outburst. <laughs> I was pretty good. I mean, I said, well, you know, I've got some issues with, oh, no, no, you don't understand. It was mm -mm. like this religious conversion experience going on. I said, you know, let's just agree to disagree. <laughs> you don't understand. And I said, you know. I worked at television a long time. He's never going to get enough money off of reality TV sales to fund this. And that's not enough anyway. He was talking about five or six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's really expensive to do this stuff. It's really hard to do this stuff. You didn't even get a, we're going to have a lander in 2014. I mean, 16. I mean, 18. I mean, 20. <laughs> it's like, well, then how are you going to get people there in 20? So, yeah. Do things like that end up sort of souring the appetite for the public of doing things like this? That was my primary mm -hmm. complaint. Yeah. I don't mind vision. I don't mind yeah. drive a dedication. I don't even mind a little fantasy because it did get a lot of people excited because they said, yeah. wait, I could be a part of this for $36? Yeah. Um, but I think most of us knew it was going to hit a wall and crash and burn. Mm -hmm. And it has, arguably. And um, I think it makes it harder for the next person to come along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then you get something like Dennis Tito and Inspiration Mars, which could have worked as long as you were willing to sit in that capsule for nine months or whatever the round trip would have been. That was a fly around. Mars, I think it makes it harder for people then because they say, oh, that's like that other yeah. muscle. You know? Yeah, in fact, yeah. I remember when Dennis Tito came out talking about Inspiration Mars, there were so many comparisons to Mars One when it came out, even though yeah. it had been much better researched and much, and you know, funding sources were actually like trying to find those um, as opposed yeah. to just asking people to pay for an application. You well, know, you didn't so. have to invent a lander. Mm -hmm. You just flew around, like you said. You don't go down to Mars's gravity well. Mm -hmm. You just sling by and come home. Yeah. yeah, and those. I mean, that's you know, studies have been done by NASA. You know, in the sixties, that oh, endlessly did that. Yeah. You know, with the Apollo applications program, like you were talking with the crewed Venus flyby. Right. You know that that there was an actual framework there that could have been developed around that. The scary one was they had the Mars flyby or the Venus flyby or the Mars and Venus flyby, which I think was 18 months or 20 months or something, which of course by the time you came back, you'd be, my extra antenna because all that radiation, but that would have been a long time, even in Skylab, mm -hmm. you know, Skylab size thing. Yeah. I'm less familiar with this Mars, uh, what, what is it, experience? Oh, that's cop Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. no, no, um, but, um, no. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> would you, how would that have worked? Or um, Planet dynamic wise, if you just go orbit once or twice, then no, back. there's no orbit. So, this was oh, strictly just a flyby. Fly so, that's why I said it's, yeah. it's a year plus out there for an mm -hmm. eight or 12 hour hey, Mars, how's it going? Oh, but, bye. Yeah, it, <laughs> and then it, you're but, done. But coming back from Mars, yeah. it's best to, once you, by the time you get out there, the planets have changed position relative yes. right. to each other. So, you would yeah. need to kill some time out there to make yeah. it easier to get back. Otherwise, you've got quite the journey there, on the way home. There actually are free return trajectories that you can right. launch yourself on where, where the trajectory you've launched on and a little bit of the gravity from flying by Mars ends mm -hmm. up bending you back so you right. intercept the Earth. But it's like it's like Rod's saying here where like it's nine months to get to Mars, but then it's like 
15 to 18 months swinging around. And maybe going yeah, past yeah. Venus to get there, yeah. Yeah. right? So, why so, not throw in Venus is, I guess, what I'm saying. Like, well, it's just yeah. baking out there all that time. <laughs> we course. still haven't right. solved the radiation of problem. Course. No. You know? And yeah. Uh, yeah, we actually did a piece up at Griffith Observatory where it was uh, raising five. It, they said they were raising five billion dollars to go to Mars with the entire trip. And no. Who the, said? The, oh, no, no, the, the Mars One oh, I thought you meant team. Griffith oh, was no, there. No. I said, and, oh, uh, wow, they've really come a long way since I was there. That's right? cool. Yeah. Yeah. City of funding a, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a small expedition to Mars. Yeah, so. but uh, by, we did a nice piece. knowing it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we did a piece where it was like, uh, oh, by the way, the toilet on the International Space Station cost $19 billion. Sorry, $1 million. Dollars. I was gonna say, oh, yeah, million I was gonna, dollars. whoa, that's, that's, that's NASA's budget this yeah, year. Hold on. Sorry, so, guys. Yeah, $19 yeah. million dollars for, you know, R&D and implementation. Right. Just, just, and it just still the breaks. toilet. And it still didn't work great. Just the toilet. But, <laughs> but it was way better than what they did in the Apollo era, which was the top hat, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I met, I met Al yeah. Borden, the command module pilot yes. of Apollo 15, and he once, uh, he said uh, that that uh, after they saw the top hat, they used to joke that real men flew Apollo because they didn't wear a, an undergarment to catch everything. Well, know. and they just didn't eat much. That's where, <laughs> that's where low to. residue dining comes in. So <laughs> you want it to go in and be absorbed and not see the light of day again. Actually, I was with Worden um, last week. I went from Pasadena to... Tucson for a festival of books there, which was cool. 130,000 people showed up for a book festival. Wow. wow. The town's only like 330,000 or something. That's quite a few people. Wow. Americans can That's still read. Yeah, and they care, right? That's amazing. Good. That was great. So we had these pack sessions. So I was up with Alan Stern, who's a really nice guy, and mm -hmm. Jim Hansen, who wrote First Man. I'm spending a lot of time thinking, what am I doing on panels with these guys? You know, I'm a mid-list author. So that was 82 degrees. Then got on a plane and flew to Des Moines, Iowa for Celebrate Innovation Week, which is this really cool conference this guy named Tony Poshton puts on, does a great job. Hi, Tony. And um, got off the plane, it was seven. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever been in seven degrees. Mm. I'm not even sure I've been in single digit degrees. Oh. It was like walking into Superman's Crystal Palace of Solitude or whatever it was. It was really shocking. But anyway, um, that was for a, another event, and we had an Apollo astronaut panel, mm -hmm. and again, you know, so I got Al Worden and Fred Hayes and Walt Cunningham and Jerry Griffin, the, the flight director mm -hmm. there. I'm standing on the stage trying to appear relatively calm and normal, but inside I'm like, I'm gonna wet my pants, these are Apollo astronauts. It was really incredible. <laughs> and, and Worden was just, I mean, he is the best storyteller and really knows how to relate those, those tales about what they did to the public in a way that he, he gets the room, he's very engaging, I mean, they all were. But afterwards, we had to take him to the airport, and Tony said, what do you want for lunch? And he said, I've always wanted to try Chick-fil-A. So we went to Chick-fil-A, and the next thing you knew, the entire kitchen staff is out there. We assign our cow? You know the cow that says, eat more chicken on the side? Yeah. No. Chick-fil-A <laughs> thing. It's like, the only cows eat chicken. So these little stuffed cows. So he was signing people's cows, because he's very gracious. Anyway, that's not much of a story, but that was uh, my first meeting with Al Worden. Nice. Yeah. He's a fun, I, I, I got to spend a day with him uh, a couple years ago at a uh, at, uh, workplace. And, uh, oh, you must have been somewhat corrupted by the end of a whole day. I was. That's pretty I heard, incredible. I've heard stories of what it really was like to be a fighter jock in the 60s and 70s. So mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting, I have to say. More fun than our lives, Oh, probably. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just a little bit. So yeah, uh, yeah. what could be remembered um, or what could be <laughs> spoken of. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a, just a little bit interesting. Um, <laughs> Thank you, officer. <laughs> well, statute of limitations. Um, anyways, uh, sort of uh, to, to move on a little bit uh, from this, uh, to sort of talk about, you know, Apollo, you know, big rockets, capsule, small spacecraft to have a, a very set concrete mission um, going on. There's, there was obviously a very big amount of news this week about another big rocket with a small capsule trying to do a very specific thing, mm -hmm. which was uh, the space launch system and the movement of EM-1 to, you know, commercial launch and things like that, and uh, and uh, yeah, just you know, <laughs> a, a wake up and go, yes. what? Yeah, kind I of think, moment. Yeah, I think there were a couple of NASA centers that went, <gasps> they're doing it, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> sort of like that. Um, and yeah, that uh, I mean, do you feel like that's kind of sort of like going to shift uh, things around? Like maybe there's a fire been lit under some people's butts. Uh, well, I think do you know we saw that with the National Space Council with them being mm -hmm. put back into action. Mm -hmm. And pretty early on, part of the mandate 
including you know the incoming Trump administration, was let's use our commercial assets to our best advantage. And that was one of the, I mean, if there's a core to the Space 2.0 book, which came out last week, mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, what is the sweet spot between NASA, other international government agencies, and the private sector mm -hmm. all around the world, but especially in the U.S., because you, you, I talked to, I don't know, I interviewed, I think, 40 people for this book, so heads of the international space agencies and NASA officials and Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX and Rob Myers at Blue Origin and so forth. And, it, it, you know, really the, the big power in private space flight, entrepreneurial space flight, is in the U.S. because mm -hmm. of our tax structure and the fact that we have a lot of billionaires here. And it makes sense to do that. But where is this magical spot that's going to make what we all want happen, mm -hmm. happen in space? And, you know, you look at NASA's own internal studies that say, yeah, you know, SpaceX can do things for somewhere between half and a tenth of what it costs us. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not such a bad idea. And, and even JPL now is uh, looking at outsourcing a mission to India, at least the, the fabrication hmm. and, and some of the operation of it, because they did their first Mars orbiter for $36 million with an M. And it costs us hundreds, sometimes as much as I think Insight was $800 million. So um, it does make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I think you've got to find that 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 right balance. But but getting specifically to your point, um, I think it, it makes a whole lot of sense to start flying stuff on um, the Falcon Heavy and ultimately uh, New Glenn when it comes into operation because you know, SLS is just an expensive older design. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's gonna cost per flight. I keep hearing a billion five, but when I look at how far the manifest is gonna go, how many flights that's probably gonna be and how much they've spent doing it, just you know, kind of redesigning the, the the Saturn V in twice the time it took to do the Saturn V. That's unfair, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that NASA is operating on a tenth the budget it had then and mm -hmm. doing fifty times as much stuff. So yeah. it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think they're going to fly it out very long, and it'll be very expensive. Yeah, yeah I was kind of thinking, you know, is uh, what's really the problem at the moment with with NASA? Like besides PR, obviously, and talking to. And uh, communicating their what mission. there's a problem like what's what's the current issue like why do we keep seeing things like uh, like SLS and other things yeah. happen is it is it political is it budgetary is it just culture like, yes yes and yes yeah, <laughs> right? I mean the budget's small comparatively mm -hmm. speaking at least compared to what it was in the 60s um, however we should be able to do more with less than we have in the past because we did a lot of heavy lifting then as mm -hmm. did the Russians as the Soviet Union at the time. So uh, what are the other reasons? Well, institutionally, it's hardened a bit. You know, they, they don't have the kind of flexibility. And you could talk to the, the astronauts and the flight directors and the officials from the 60s, and they'll tell you that. Chris Kraft will tell you that. It's not the flexible fleet of foot, highly adaptable organization that it was. Mm -hmm. There's a big conversation about taking risk. How much risk can you take? Yeah. When you look at Apollo, what they were doing right on the bleeding edge with that hardware from the 1960s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable that it worked. The further we get from it, the less I can believe it worked. We're almost as far from Apollo now as it was from the Wright brothers' first flight of canvas and wooden airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I still have a hard time believing yeah. that we I did mean, it. I mean, I have a, a hard time comprehending the fact that the Apollo program you know, only had one accident. Yeah, you know, like and it was on the cons ground. Considering mm -hmm. what happened, you know, yeah. and what they were working with, and just how far, you know, they were pushing the edge. They only had one accident, and like you said, it was on the ground. Yeah. How did how did that even like how did that did not happen? You know, like, I know. Well, and then if you go, have you ever gone to uh, you've gone to Kennedy Space Center, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, they've got a half. You need to go. Yeah, they've got a half. I do want to go. So. Tomorrow they've got a, yeah. a partially finished lunar module. I think it's a test item, test item three or something. You can go up to it. So you see the lunar module display up there. Like, wow, what a spaceship. First first true spaceship, you know, not yeah. designed to fly in atmosphere mm -hmm. and all that. Then you see the one on the ground. You go up and go, coink with the hull. And you realize it really was only as thick as a couple of Coke cans, you think. Mm -hmm. So wait, you guys got in that for how long? And you slept <laughs> on the surface of the moon and that thing that go in any moment? So when you, yeah, when you look at, at how close they're pushing to the edge and then the computers, of course, 36K mm -hmm. of memory, you know, barely capable of doing what they had to do, but they did it brilliantly. So getting back to the core question, you know, how do we get that NASA back? Well, I think we did the, as hard as it was, that was the easiest stuff to do in the solar system, mm -hmm. Earth orbit and then the moon. 
and now Mars is that, you know, that's really going out there. It's demanding a lot more for a lot less money than we had mm -hmm. at the time. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, again, part of it, like I said, is risk, but, it, but primarily political motivation and willpower. Yeah. We had a perfect enemy in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union in the 1960s. I'll show you. Yep. Yep. I'm going to show. Our missile's bigger than your missile, you know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of interesting metaphor. Yeah, um, yeah no, it, and, it, and it was. It we turned wrote our out. name on the moon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I still like that idea of hey, let's let's blow up nuclear weapons on the moon to show off. Look how powerful we are. <laughs> well, it would have been I kind of cool. About that, you know? so, yeah, yeah would have been. The moon. Well, that would have been mm -hmm. a little but, interesting. But um, you know, we had this 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 arch enemy, mm -hmm. and more than than proving to them, hey, you know, we're the bigger dog on the on the on the beach because. You could just send over nuclear missiles to do that. We want to show the non-aligned nations mm -hmm. and the countries that are waffling, well, should we follow the Soviet camp or the American camp? Mm -hmm. Come with us. Yeah. We got better school. We got better technology. We got bigger rockets. We went to the moon, and then we decided to stop after three years. So there's that political motivation. Some people think we're going to get that back because of China. I don't personally, but yeah. it could yeah. happen because China in a couple of years may walk into a session of Congress and go up to the Ameri American delegation and say, hey, here's that flag you left behind the moon, Paul Evan, it's kind of bleached out, but I, we thought you might want it back. It's like, oh, wait, you guys just went there and landed? Mm -hmm. So who knows, you know, mm -hmm. that can change everything. Yeah, I know a lot of NASA's um, internal problem, I, I mean, political issues. Challenges. Challenges, thank you. Uh, come from having to represent various constituent bases. Um, is, is it even possible for NASA to do do the pushes that we need a big government-backed uh, organization to do while making the entrenched, yeah, um, yeah, the, the 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 people who make the hardware and have been making it since the '60s, and we expect to have this money coming to us, right. ha keeping them happy, lobbying. Congress. Yeah, you left the C right. word out of that conversation. I, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, so I don't know. You know, wouldn't it be delightful, as in China, for the most part, where they've separated those things, yeah. and you get an executive order from the Politburo, who's agreed, okay, let's uh, let's do this and this and this, and we'll end up with people on Mars in 2040. Go forth and fetch. You know. Yeah. And they just get to do it because they don't have these chains of administration. Now they don't have any chains of administration, at least on the presidential end. Not that I'm for that kind of form of government, but I do like the idea of some enhanced continuity mm -hmm. and not sending NASA off on these fruitless errands where mm -hmm. you don't get to finish a program like we did the Constellation. There was a Senate launch system. Yeah, there was a. It's one way to. <laughs> now she brought it in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well um, done. I, wasn't there like a idea from a Congress uh, congressional representative a couple years ago that that we should like approve NASA budgets on like a like a decade scale? Yeah. So that way the the goals and the the sort of you know the points that we want to get to are are locked in for a long-term period so that way it's not you know every administration fluctuating wildly mm -hmm. back and forth like flapping it in the wind until it breaks there was that idea and I thought that sounds pretty good to me but then I was talking to a former deputy administrator of the agency who said no I don't think you want to give them ten-year mandates why not because it's just too easy to go off in the wrong direction mm. it mm. should be continuous oversight and revision but make it more continuous over right, right. oversight and, and revision. And shouldn't it be oversight by the right people? Well, hence the, the National Space Council. So right. hopefully that's the right group of people. If you've ever met or talked to Scott Pace, he's a brilliant guy, okay. very, very settled, very logical, really, I think, doing that group a lot of good. Um, and the people in it are pretty good. Now they have this advisory group, which mm -hmm. brings in an even larger set of voices underneath. So I think they're doing good work. Um, how much that will actually impact what NASA does is still something that we're kind of waiting to see and what it will be. I mean, I think they have done very well in bringing commercial into the conversations you were saying with this idea of putting Orion on Falcon Heavy and New Glenn. It's like, remember what? <laughs> <laughs> you say you're yeah. doing what? Um, <laughs> yeah. But with the cancellation of that, that enhanced upper stage for SLS, mm -hmm. you need to do something. So. Yeah.
And is, uh, is, you know, a lot of people like to place the entire blame of SLS and development and everything on NASA. Well, you know, I know a lot of people who will throw it 100 percent at their court that, you know, NASA is the ones who have who've botched this. But is it really kind of NASA? Or is there also, like, you know, you can throw some blame at contractors as well on the project? Well, SLS but. isn't botched. It's just mm -hmm. going slowly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will work. I think it's proven technology. I mean, a space shuttle engine, space shuttle derived SRBs. It'll work. It's just very slow and very expensive. Um, you know, when you talk to NASA, there's a mixed reaction there. Some people wanted it, some don't. Uh, Marshall was big on it because it would made yeah. sense for them. Mm -hmm. But I, it was Congress that said, "No, you got to do this," because we've got a lot of people saying that you got to do it. So you got to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know there is one other. Uh, side to this, which I hear mentioned very little, it's it's not likely, but Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos could wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know, this rocket thing isn't making me much money. I don't think I'm going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then SLS is your baby mm -hmm. if you want heavy lift. I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. Somebody else would come in behind them, possibly the Chinese, who are now flying reusable rocket tests that Boy, do they look a lot like the Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. And you ask him, mm -hmm. journalists asked him, that looks a lot like the Falcon 9. He said, of course it does. What do you expect? Thanks for the developments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it does make sense to have it. I just wish that it could be a little more lean, mean, and mainstreamed. And, you know, possibly a higher percentage of cooperation with contractors would have made sense. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And now we got to build lunar landers. Yes, they that put is, out that yeah. RFP, which is great. Yeah, like because we were, you know, there's a lot of us worried about, you know, having a, a smaller ISS out around the moon is kind of cool, and we like the idea. But can you like take that last 120 down? miles or whatever it is down yeah. to and go back like we did a long time ago? Mm -hmm. And so now that's been issued, and yeah. hopefully we'll see some development there because ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to go to these places. We want to extract resources from these places because we're human beings. Mm -hmm. We need them. And we want people to be able to eventually get there. And the great thing about the moon, as I'm sure you both know, is you got water, you got oxygen, not just in the water, but in the very rocks and soil. Mm -hmm. You got all these silicates, you got metals, you got everything you need there to build whatever you want. So why spend six or eight thousand dollars per gallon of water to launch it off of Earth? It's hmm. expensive. It may actually be more than that. I don't remember the exact number anymore because SpaceX has brought that down. When you've got it all sitting out there, the Chinese know that. That's what their robotic program is aimed at. Yeah, kind of, yeah. kind of proof of concept mm -hmm. on those things like that. So, yeah. yeah. So is the is is uh, is going to the moon sort of going to enable us to go to other places as well, or could we just <laughs> could we just outright go to Boy, those other just, places? Just throw the fastball right in my face. So <laughs> moon equals Mars, right? Sure. Um, yes, in the big picture, I believe it will. Is it the fastest way to do it? Probably not. You know, Apollo was the fastest way to get to the moon. Mm -hmm. Should we do that for Mars and make it expeditionary in nature, a sortie? Some people think so. A lot of people say, no, don't do that. That's a dead end. And Apollo, as brilliant as it was, didn't have to be a dead end. But by the time they finished flying out the program, you know, and you know the last three were canceled and all that, yeah. it kind of was. That hardware was discontinued, didn't have to be, and the shuttle came in. So, um, you know, is, is the moon a stepping stone? Yes. Does it have to be a stepping stone? Probably not. But I think more realistically, it's the only thing we're going to be able to sell mm -hmm. over the next... 10 years to the public when you're talking about tax supported stuff. If Elon Musk holds up his aspirational deal and says, I'm going to be at Mars by 2024, I'm still not quite sure. Maybe somebody around here knows something about this, but <laughs> I'm still not quite sure, you know, how the radiation protection in, in the BFR slash Starship is going to work because mm -hmm. I just don't see it in what few schematics I've seen. No. Because you're going to be out there a long time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. So, I think that part's thrilling, but yeah, let's make the moon away station. Let's get there. Let's get settled, settled in. Let's really work out this in situ resource extraction and utilization mm -hmm. process, so we know what we're doing. When we get to Mars. We do have an experiment on the Mars 2020 rover called Moxie, mm -hmm. which is going to grab a bit of atmosphere and extract useful things out of us. Mm -hmm. That's good. Make some oxygen. So that's a good start, but it's very small. 
Um, I think we, we get to an industrial scale on the moon doing these things, and now you're in business. Mm -hmm. Now you get people going out there, living in, in lunar orbit possibly as astronauts, living on the surface of the moon, working, really figuring it out. You know, can we actually go down and live inside lava tubes and not end up having each other for dinner by accident? Yeah. Let's make sure. Probably, but let's make sure. And then Mars makes an awful lot of sense. Yeah. And then we'll just hop on the Pan Am, you know, Orion 3 and head on up, right? Oh, you so. know, you're a heartbreaker, man. <laughs> I still look at those pictures and I think, why didn't they? I mean, Pan Am isn't even with us anymore, but that was such a beautiful vision. And they even sold us little tickets. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could get your ticket and your certificate in 1968 while you were waiting in the line to go see 2001 A Space Odyssey to get your Pan Am Clipper ride. I <laughs> <laughs> wonder if they'll honor that at some point. You know. Well, there's no Pan Am. Yeah. Well, I mean, someone else can pick it up, whoever does it, right? Yeah, I actually got contacted by a lawyer a few years ago who claimed to own, I guess the Pan Am identity is split up into seven or eight different entities. Huh. He had one of them. I thought, what could you do with that? And then I found I was sort of thinking like the Mars One people. I thought, ew, no, okay, that's not a good idea. <laughs> but it seemed like a neat idea at the time because Pan Am, that whole thing was really inspirational. And as you know, there's groups still trying to do that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, really the Musks and the Bezoses and the Bransons are the ones that are going to make that operate. And Branson, I mean, Virgin Galactic has been really in the news lately. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. They're yeah. close. And hopefully yeah. Virgin Orbit's yeah. going to be coming into the news yeah. pretty soon, mm -hmm. too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and how can you go wrong with 747? I mean, that, yeah. and the lion's I mean, share, the lifting, that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I drive past it and I see it. You yeah. Know, just sitting there, you know, out there. And just like, man, I can't wait to see that Do thing drop and rocket. you sneak into the hangar? Um, I'm, I, tip, I like uh, not uh, being asked to leave places. So Especially I'm, with I, guns pointed at you? Yeah, <laughs> typically. So, yeah. So Sometimes it's worth it, though. You know? It can be. So, hmm. yeah, I was going to say. Uh, Any stories? A couple, couple of times <laughs> out at uh, Armstrong, right? So I know Stud is uh, kind of nodding over there. Uh, it's sort of a certain door. Oh, do tell, uh, yes. Mm. A certain door that said SR-71 personnel on it that uh, everybody stopped at to take photos, and we were told very quickly to move along. So, uh, yeah, that was. It wasn't the NASA people telling us that, though. So. Well, they're, they're very nice. I was shooting in an air show years ago. They had invited us to come shoot video. And I'm walking up towards, I think it was an F-18, and suddenly this kid, you know, is pulling guard duty. Mm -hmm. I hear this clink, I'm looking over, and there's an M-16. It's not aimed at me or an M-4, but it's kind of held like this. It's like, no, you can't look down the engine duct. Oh. Oh, which is okay, but tell me before. Right. Yeah. Well, you know? in there. And, you know, with stories, yep. ah. you are a writer. Yep. So you're not just like a super expert on space flight <laughs> and also right. exceptionally good at talking about uh, a, a very interesting <laughs> time at Griffith Observatory. Yeah. Uh, you also write, like you just talked about space journalism and, and you and your involvement in it. Yeah. So So what? So like <laughs> so, so, so what what does that entail? You know? Like writing about space? Yeah, because yeah, like you you're helping deliver uh, that maybe maybe helping work against that PR problem. Oh, you we make it sound about. so noble. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote fiction as a kid, mm -hmm. and after reading my own stuff and sitting around with some friends, I realized that the kindest thing I could do for the world is never try to write fiction again. Because <laughs> I like my my readers and my fans. It's like I will not make them go through that. But at the same time, so I went to UCLA as an astronomy major originally. Mm -hmm. And I lasted about a year and a half until mm. I got to differential calculus, which most people would have taken before they went to UCLA, but I was a little bit behind the power curve. And I went, oh, oh, astronomy is math. Oh, <laughs> this is really bad. So that's when I changed over to film school and, and journalism and realized that the really fun part was not being a sub-average scientist or engineer, which would have been me. You know, I'd be the guy with the big pencil while <laughs> trying to figure the equations, Ooh, calculator. Um, the fun part was talking to people about it and communicating these stories. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me into TV in the first place, is doing documentaries about it. But then you're trying to tell the whole Apollo project in 44 minutes. And it's like, what do you mean? And and you're up through Apollo 13 at minute 39. Mm -hmm. And then for the next five minutes, you've got to wrap up the other four. And it happens every time. Mm -hmm. I thought this is like writing for TV Guide, or now you'd say Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. TV mm -hmm. Guide. You guys don't remember TV Guide? No, oh, I remember yeah. TV Guide. Oh, little little things that say, you know, here's what it is and what channel it'll be on. Yeah, a little yeah. tiny yeah. bit. Yeah. It's no way to tell stories. So then when I started getting book offers, I thought, wait a minute, you're going to actually pay me something 
to to act like a pig in mud and get down and roll around this story mm -hmm. about space for a couple of months or a year and then other people are going to read it and, and maybe like it. Well, yeah, that's how book authoring works. <laughs> By golly, you know, I was kind of like a country <laughs> hick getting his first car and uh, and have never looked back. It is just the most fun, except for being on this show, that you can have <laughs> in the space trade. <laughs> no, really. I mean, I really like coming down here. This is every time I drive down here, it's like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> yes. But, but, yeah, writing that stuff is great. And um, I just wish that I could get sometimes a little more access to the big players. You know, right. you've got to really hustle if you're going to get in with SpaceX, get in with Voyager, and get in with some of the others. Because, you know, they want to control the outflow of PR. Mm -hmm. So if you're mm -hmm. writing those stories, you have to get clever and, you know, look around the curtain sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's the wizard. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that man. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, we we... Most of our content for Ad Astra is written externally. Mm. Anybody around here that might mm. have some skill in that area? Uh, wait, wait, where were, do we submit? If only there <laughs> were some people that were writers. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so okay. the editorial email address is in there, and that, uh, that funny-looking guy with the... I think we know this guy. Yeah, the, the guy looks familiar. Shirt, mm -hmm. shirt, so, yeah, yeah. Sure yeah. Um, so it's a good, so, it's yeah. a nice shirt. So, so feel free. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I've had it for way too long, so feel free to <laughs> to, to pitch, and um, cool. we do we do pay. Yeah, excellent. That is How amazing. about that? Yeah, that, we pay, whoa. and it's in print. And I, I gotta know. say, you know, so many. I mean, there's a lot of good magazines out there about space. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's the Planetary Report from Planetary Society, and there's Mercury from the Astronomy Society Pacific, and a bunch of others. But they're not in print, a lot of them, anymore, because it is so expensive to do that. So one of the yeah. things I love about the NSS, there are many, mm -hmm. is that they're willing to commit to keeping this in print. And we uh, operate on a very tight budget with a staff of um, two and a half, which is not a lot when you're doing it yeah. quarterly. <laughs> yep. But, I mean, being able to put it on paper is really special. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know if, if in 20 years paper magazines will still exist, but I'm glad they do now. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's nice to see that uh, that there's something still continuing, you know, with space journalism, especially stuff independent from major major networks and other yeah. news groups, mm -hmm. because they kind of tend to not necessarily get it wrong, but they they skim over details that are actually pretty important, you know, and and a lot of the cool stuff too they'll forget about, including that. Well, but you bring so up, pre digested. Mm -hmm. It kind of is. You yeah. bring up an interesting point, though. You've got to appeal to a certain audience, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to sell yeah. these things. Yeah. Now we have a built-in audience because this goes to membership. Yeah. So you know, ten thousand plus issues plus the uh, extended members, which puts it up to I think thirty, um, which isn't bad. Uh, for the next issue, which is the Apollo special issue, which mm -hmm. I think I mentioned, which is going to be longer, heavier cover stock, but I think it's going to be a third longer in terms of pages, that is going to be available to the public. So we're okay. going to send it out digitally, possibly in print, but digitally for sure. We're mm -hmm. going on to new platforms. Um, and that's exciting because yeah. uh, I mean, the whole reason I joined the NSS in the first place was I saw a copy of this magazine on the newsstand and paid, I don't know, that outrageous price of two ninety nine or something, mm. <laughs> and I was reading this and I said, "These guys are cool. I want to join this organization." So I'm really hoping at least once a year to get a special issue out to the world so they can see what we're doing and come join. The rest of the year it'll probably be a member benefit for a while, but ultimately I think it makes sense to open it up to the public because there just aren't that many out there. Mm -hmm. And this isn't this isn't immediate news like Space.com where they get something new every day and it's up there in eight minutes because their writers work really fast. This is a quarterly that really looks at, at longer term trends. Yeah. I don't think it's in that issue. I think it's in the previous one. We did a big write up on the SLS, which a, a wonderful writer named John Cross wrote. And uh, it was a tough story. Because yeah. you're talking about where it's headed and what's happening with the upper stage and what that means and you know what what's the net result of all this going to be? What's it going to get us? What are the challenges? And he did a really good story. So I think that's something that should be seen beyond immediate membership. Mm -hmm. But if you join, mm -hmm. get this near your mailbox every quarter. Well worth it. Yeah. 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 And if uh, you know someone's really interested in kind of like getting into journalism, especially like space journalism, uh, like what are some of the things that they should really consider? Run, running away. No. Uh. Um, you mean in terms of, of getting the, the work? 
Yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you have to think about? Like, you know, you gotta grab contacts within the industry, obviously, and, and you, have, you might have to go to things and other stuff. Like, what's some of the stuff that someone should be prepared to do in order to, to make Stock it? Stocking a lot of top ramen, because you're probably yeah. gonna need it. <laughs> um, it's interesting, you know, we were talking about this before, before we started. When I started writing books in 2003 or four-ish, you know, a first-time author could get a commission of $35,000. Sure, we trust you. Yeah. Here's a bunch of money. Go write a book. Um, now, if you get anything, this is nonfiction. If you get anything for your first-time commission, it's probably going to be four or five thousand dollars, or you're going to be self-publishing. Self-publishing. The average self-published book sells 12 copies per year. 12. Yeah. One, two. And that's to relatives and friends. Mm -hmm. So it's very challenging. Journalism's a little different, but what's so interesting there is. In a way, there's more opportunity than ever before because there's so many venues, but they're not curated very well for the most part. So if you're working for, not, not don't want to impugn anybody in particular, but let's say Yahoo News. You've seen some of the stories in Yahoo News. Some are pretty good. They're usually picked up from another source. Mm -hmm. Some are not very good. They're often internally generated. Um, you see, I've seen stuff that I've written that was tra machine translated in Hindi and then machine translated back into English. Oh. So I, I feel like my Labrador looking at calculus going, what, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so, you know, cost is the big thing, and they want stuff cheap. If you guys have explored this, you know that there are people yeah. that will proudly offer you $15 a story for what could be a two or three days of work. And mm -hmm. you think, well, do people really live on this, even in, nope. you know, Bratislava? Can you love the cut of money? So I think um, there's, there's two categories of writers that are really killing it right now. Very young people that don't have a lot of expenses and are fresh out of school or maybe they haven't, they haven't taken journalism school at all and don't need to, but who are just jamming into this because they want to and money's not, not critical. And then guys my age who are looking at retirement and maybe Social Security if there's anything left when we get there who are saying, hey, money's no longer a big factor because I'm retired, but that big chunk in the middle, which is where most of the people are should be doing it, mm -hmm. Who are partway through their careers? They're polished. They're developed. They're smart. They've got experience. They know how to, to run down sources. They know what's okay to do, what's not okay to do, uh, how to really create compelling, engaging, breaking stories. Those are the ones we need, and that's the hard part because it's very difficult for them to make a living anymore. Mm. So I would say, if you're looking for advice for people, start early, find what you're going to focus on, and then really, you know, just bang on that as much as possible. If it's the technology side, great. If it's the policy side, great. There's not enough people writing about policy. Mm. It's a little bit of a, a bit more challenging area in some ways. If you're gonna do history, well, don't do it until I'm done, okay? Because I don't need the competition. <laughs> but if you're gonna do history, you know, do that and, and really just focus on that and specialize and then you'll soon be rich, well, famous anyway. I was gonna yeah. say rich and famous. But <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll be famous. <laughs> Yeah. Right. yeah. So if people want to know more about you and also about your books as well, how can they do that? Oh, this means we're wrapping up. No. <laughs> I don't want to wrap up. <laughs> I got so many more observatory stories to tell. Um, that's yeah, for yeah, After Dark. That's after yeah, dark. okay. Uh, I have a website called pilebooks.com. It's P-Y-L-E books.com. Not like it sounds. But mm -hmm. That's not how you spell my name. And um, this magazine is a good way to keep track. And then I do radio here in L.A. on KFI, which is kind of our blowtorch 50,000 watt uh, talk station. Mm. Every couple of weeks I do WGN in Chicago and the overnight show, that's interesting because you get all the interesting calls. <laughs> we never went to the moon. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and then I have a podcast on iHeart called Cool Space News by Rod Pyle, <laughs> complete with the Lost in Space theme music. Nice. I know nice. how to groove, man. Sweet. Yeah. That sounds great. So, Rod, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank really you. appreciate it. And, uh, you know, you've thank got you. so much stuff to share with everybody. Uh, we, we really encourage everyone to go and, and read and, uh, and check it all out. Yeah, and they're yeah. going to get free books. Yes. What? Reading. Yeah. <laughs> Reading's so good. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for keeping the torch. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and to wrap up our show, we are going to thank all of our patrons of tomorrow. Uh, these folks help us out financially. You know, they help give money to us that allows us to bring these things to you. And we wouldn't be able to do any of this, you know, share Rod's story, uh, all the other fun things with that, actually talk about uh, what you can do to help spread the good word about spaceflight and other things without, uh, without your support. So you are all critical to helping make this show happen. And we're so thrilled that you all feel like being a part of this show. So thank you guys so much for watching tomorrow, episode 12.09, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.